All right, he mentioned the possibility of a steepening yield curve, but we haven't seen it in the bank's earnings seem to be suffering or at least a focus of investors as to why the stocks aren't go, going to go up. Really, the whole bank stock uh, market has been really driven around this whole rate change. And I think what's interesting is to go back and look at where we were. On June 8th of last year, the regional banks hit an all-time high, the bigger banks in February. At that time, we were looking for 11 percent earnings per share growth going into 2020. Today, we sit here, we're now looking for negative 2 percent earnings per share change going into 2020. So what changed? The entire rate outlook changed. Back then, we were thinking higher rates, good for the banks, strong economy. Today, we've got a flat yield curve that's uh, low rates. And so it's really changed the operating environment, which has become more uh, challenging for banks. And I think really for the, for the third quarter earnings, which start in earnest on Tuesday, where we are in that story is really the big issue because we think that earnings estimates are probably still too high. Still too high. I mean, you do have a lot of profitability at these banks. Yes. Uh, but it's the lack of growth, you think, that is going to weigh on investor perception and continue that, to... That, that's what's been weighing on these, uh, on these stocks. So on September 5th, we cut estimates for 221 banking companies that we follow. At the time, we were 10 percent below the rest of the street. Today, I think we're 5 percent less based on 2020 earnings. There's a, I, I, what I hope would happen is that there'd be a more clear view as to what the earnings outlook is, and I think that would help the stocks possibly find a floor. Reuters has a memo, apparently, out of Wells, that they're building larger mortgage loan fulfillment teams to get ready for next year. Is Steve right? Could we get more lending if the Ab curves? Absolutely. Mortgage lending, absolutely. And believe me, the capacity is there to make those loans. And uh, we're looking for 27% year-over-year growth in the third quarter in the mortgage business. That'll be one of the bright spots of the quarter that we we'll think we'll start hearing. And it will continue. The refi boom is going to gin up again. I want to get your thoughts on something else. you got Fidelity now, the latest to cut online trading commissions to zero. It's been a big story for the past week, really, for a while now. The fact that we're seeing all of this digitization in finance, what is it doing to the cost for investment and what does that mean for the banks and also just the financials more broadly? Yeah, so I think there are a lot of interesting things. I think two stories here. The first one is, is that it's actually, when I was younger, banks would give away things to bring deposits in. You can get a toaster. It's actually cheaper today to give away a free trade than it is to make a toaster. <laughs> so really what it is all about is, is gathering customers, because these companies are going to make money doing something else. And I thought it was interesting today, because in my morning paper, there are three full-page ads from TD, Fidelity, and Schwab all going at it, okay? So that's number one. So I think that's about customer acquisition and how technology's lowered the cost of that. The second thing is you're absolutely right. If you're not investing in digital digital technologies to serve your customers, you're falling behind, which means that this whole scale argument is building in the banking industry. And it's the reason why we have SunTrust coming together with bb and and have Truist and why I think there's going to be more consolidation. Back to the group itself. I, I know valuations are at what, well, val lows we haven't seen in quite some time. Do you anticipate that multiples at all could increase from here? So here, so you're right. So we, we've gone back 15 years. We're at a historically low P.E. ratio, relative multiple to the market, and our dividend yield is at a historical high. This spring is coiled and ready, I think, to go for bank stocks to outperform. But until the operating environment becomes more clear, in my opinion, it's probably unlikely to happen. But, Tom, we could be looking at a, at a flat yield curve or a ZERP frac Practically, I mean, hell, we could still be talking about negative rates that they have in Europe as a possibility. That is bad for the banking industry. I mean, you go to Europe. I mean, it, it's not an experiment. It's happening in Europe. Those companies can't earn double-digit returns on equity, and they traded a big discount to book. And what I would call on for policymakers is, before you go to negative rates, think about what it does to the banking industry. And our banking industry is the leading banking industry in the world. And I would be careful before that happens. I do think it would be negative for banks. Is underwriting behavior going to change after what we've seen in the past month in IPOs? Uh, so I have a different take on this. Um, I think it's not a function about the IPO market. I think it's a function of the private market before the IPO market, because some of the valuations that were struck in those private market deals were really high. 
And one of the benefits of doing a public market is you've got full price discovery. You've got the world watching. When you do a privately raised capital raise, you better be careful because it's a thinner market. So, so, they get so I don't religion. think it's a problem with the IPO market. I think it's a problem with the private market. They get religion as opposed to us, uh, us I, being I, public I, markets. I, you know, it's kind of hard for the IPO market to speak for a price that was set in, in another market. So my view is it's all about what the investors paid. You got to pay attention to what you're paying in the private market.